Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I am very excited for you all to be joining us today as we will be going through um, the tips that we have for the perfect franchise search engine optimization. So we'll give it about 30 seconds for those joining right now, and then we'll dive in. But for those that are, are who are joining, feel free to write in the chat box, you know, where you're joining from. We'd love to hear from you and make this as interactive as possible. All right, so we are about a minute past the hour. Oh, hey, everyone. We have Granville, Barry, Chicago. We're kind of all over. I'm from New York right now. And we have UK in the house. Hey, Frazier, um, which is really cool to see. So really excited for today and really diverse crowd, which is amazing. So by way of introductions, now that we are kind of on time, um, my name is Raquel and I actually run our customer success department here at Promo Republic. So chances are, if you are a partner of ours, you have seen me before in your day-to-day -day life. Um, so here at Promo Republic, just to give some background on who we are and what we do, we are a local marketing intelligence platform and our sole goal is to help empower franchises to grow their online visibility through not only social, which many of you are familiar with, but local search as well, which brings us to today's webinar. And the best part about our platform is that it does help franchise and multi-location brands detect insights and grow not only social, as mentioned, and stay consistent there, but grow rankings. And it's really important for us to help you grow through intelligence. So we have a lot of cool um, things packed into our local intelligence engine, which help you consolidate data, analyze your current state of the union, so to speak, and get reports and make suggestions. So today's going to be a little different format. If you are familiar with our CMO peer talks, where we have a whole panel of speakers and we have an open forum discussion, um, which is really fun. And we love to do that. But we did want to kickstart what we're calling today as expert talks, where these are live webinars that are focused on the more practical side of local marketing, as opposed to kind of theorizing and sharing best practices from speaker to speaker. So we're going to do our best to invite the best local marketing experts in the franchise space to share their proven tactics, facts, predictions, and helping you with different items and tools to really smash your marketing goals. Because we all know in the franchising space, it is quite different because not only are you caring about a brand, but you're caring about several different locations. So please let us know in the chat what you think about this format afterwards. Um, we'd love to hear your feedback, or you can obviously write to us directly. We'll share some feedback in the next slide. Um, but with that said, I'm really excited to introduce our first expert today, I'm Amanda Jordan. How are you? I'm great. I'm happy to be here. Excellent. Can you tell um, everyone listening a little bit about yourself and your backgrounds? Sure. So I've worked in local SEO since 2011. Uh, my primary focus has been on service-based businesses. So a lot of it is very revenue driven. So organic SEO specifically on driving revenue and getting more clients. I've worked with uh, franchises. I've worked with utility companies. I've worked with credit unions, uh, so finance industry, home services industry, legal health. Uh, I've been kind of I worked with all sizes and all types of clients, but I especially love working with uh, enterprise level local SEO and franchise clients because there's so much complexity there that's just fun and interesting to look at the data and find out uh, creative solutions to get the results we're looking for. Excellent. Thank you uh, for sharing. And we're really excited for you to lead us off on these expert talks because as you've all just heard, her background is really impressive doing this for over 10 years. Um, so we're excited to dive into the agenda. Would you care to walk us through? Yeah. So uh, first thing I like to talk about is getting into the data. Uh, franchises and things like that, and bigger businesses like that, you have a wealth of data and information about potential clients, potential customers, and your current customers as well. So that's something that you can really dig into and take advantage of for creating uh, marketing strategies that truly work and are truly impactful. Uh, and then I want to talk about prioritization for SEO initiatives, especially when you're a franchise and you have a ton of locations. It can be hard to 
determine what should be your top priority because there's a lot of things going on at one time that could be impacting your SEO that you should potentially get to or eventually get to. Uh, and prioritization and knowing how to prioritize those issues can help you uh, get the most bang for your buck to make the most impact with your strategy and then making it easy and repeatable. Again, because we're working with multiple locations and having a large footprint of where we need to focus our marketing efforts, we want to make it as easy as possible for all of the teams that we're working with to get the initiatives done, to get it done right and make it repeatable so we can make sure we get those same results as we grow or as we acquire more businesses so that we're uh, we're setting ourselves up for, for long-term success and we're not going to see a repeat of some of the issues that we may have first found when we looked into our data. Yep, really great overview, thank you. So let's dive right in. Yeah. So this the first section is about how to leverage your local marketing data. Oh, we can go ahead and get into the next slide. Uh, so you have lots of different types of data. I'm sure you're aware of that. First party data is your own data. It's the most valuable. You know exactly uh, who it's coming from, why it's important, what they're looking for. Second party data, uh, so an extension of your data in some ways, uh, but it's a known source that you trust. Um, so it would be... Google Search Console, Google Analytics, uh, things like that, part, data that you get from your website, but it's not directly to you. And then third-party data is data that you can get from competitors and tools that are out there, like Ahrefs, SimRush, Bright Local, WhiteSpark. And those some are, are some of the SEO tools that we use to do competitor analysis and to understand the entire landscape. Uh, so uh, yeah, so there's lots of different data types and they give us a different point of view of what's going on and what we should focus on. Some things to consider when looking at third-party data is to understand who your competitor is and what their focus is. If your competitor is so big that their name alone will get them a lot of recognition, they may not be too concerned about getting those bottom of funnel, very specific SEO type keywords. So they may not be worried about getting keywords like plumber near me. They may just be looking for action plumber, if that's your business name. That may be just what they're focusing on heavily. They're not too concerned about those uh, very uh, uh, intent-driven keywords that are hard to compete for because everyone wants them. All right, so uh, first and second party data. Uh, you can use that to understand customer behavior, improve conversion rate optimization, create benchmarks across your locations, and identify underperforming locations. Uh, identifying underperforming locations is one of my favorite things to do and creating benchmarks for as well, just because it gives you a view of who needs the attention the most, uh, uh, especially when you're working with franchises and you're working directly with franchisees. Um, everyone wants more leads, right? There's, there's, um, it's going to be unlikely that anyone says, no, I don't need help. I don't need any more leads. <laughs> Everyone's going to be asking you for assistance and getting more leads, but this will help you identify who really is struggling based on the opportunity in their market versus who just is kind of like, yeah, of course I want more leads. So that uh, those benchmarks and that uh, identifying those underperforming locations is key to understanding what may be some of the issues that are underlying for the business that may even be impacting more locations or all of your locations. Uh, third party uh, data is better for understanding searcher behavior. So not just your customers, but potential customers. Uh, if you look too heavily at your first and second party data, uh, and if your SEO doesn't include some top of the funnel or research-based keywords, you may be missing an entire audience. And if you focus on that first and second party data, you won't find that audience because your content doesn't produce, uh, you're, you're not producing content that will get you in the search results for those terms. So third-party data opens you up to understanding what opportunities exist that you haven't found yet. Um, and that's a good idea to get a, a good idea of where you are and compared to your competitors. So what are your competitors doing that you're not doing? Or are they showing up that you're not showing up? And are those because there's differences in your services or things that you're doing in some ways? Or is it because they have a different strategy and there's things that you could take from their strategy and uh, apply to your business as well. So, so these are, oops. I'm sorry. No, oh, absolutely. So I was just going to step in here. You may have been familiar with this slide if you joined us on our big CMO conference that we had a few um, days ago, because we've highlighted the importance of the metrics to track across each one. 
um, both search rep or sorry, all three search reputation and visibility. Um, so I'm going to pass this back to Amanda. I would love to hear from your perspective how these metrics are really different across different industries from, as you've highlighted, home services, retail, et cetera. I'd love to get your perspective on that. Yeah, so um, it's these are all things that I look at heavily, especially for like service-based businesses. Uh, there are so many different things that play into why these metrics are important based on your industry based on your competition uh, and based on where you are in comparison to uh, like your benchmarks for competitors as well. So there's so many things that come into play. Uh, the one that I find to be the most kind of important overall is to your is search. I would say for me and most of my clients, search is the most important because if you're not showing up, your reputation isn't going to matter too much yet. So getting that, uh, and because I work in SEO visibility, which is more brand related and authority related, kind of comes in third, just because um, we're focusing on those in keywords with clear intents to make a purchase. Uh, so that so that's kind of where we focus on. We focus on the search first, uh, but then we also include that reputation and visibility because we want to get a holistic view of what's happening and what's impacting what we're doing as far as getting those clear intent keywords to make a purchase. Uh, so uh, yeah, primary goal for search for us is uh, to be have as much real estate on the first page of search results as possible. That is our goal. We want to be in the map pack. We want to be in the local service ads. We want to be in organic search results. Um, if they're giving other features in search results, which Google has started adding images as a, images from your Google business profile as a different section, if you scroll down on mobile, we want to be there too. Um, if someone clicks on the best uh, top 10 restaurants in New York City and it's a Yelp article, we also want to be in that top 10 list. We want to be as visible as possible from a, a search perspective and show up as many times as possible on the first page. Um, and then with building trust, uh, we want that reputation to be great, right? We want people to trust us and building trust is based on your reputation. Uh, we need reviews. Uh, if you do not ask for reviews, the ones you get are likely to be negative. Uh, so just having any review strategy is a good idea, but one that works with your current workflows, it makes it easy to uh, for people to ask for reviews and leave reviews is even better. Uh, one of my clients that I worked with was a utilities company in Texas. It's an energy company. And we were able to rehab their reputation significantly just by asking for reviews when people uh, were done with chat. They weren't doing that before. And that alone got their rating up from a 1.9 on our, an average to a 3.6 without doing anything else. But after adding other efforts, of course, they got, they got up higher. But just that one small improvement uh, got their ratings improved across several locations. And all we did was tell the chat uh, team to add a copy and paste this one sentence that asked them to leave a review on Google afterwards. So it's, it can be very simple, um, but the more uh, involved, uh, the more intuitive it is, the better it works. And then, and then generating awareness. So PR and branding, of course, is really important because you don't want to have to always depend on being number one for plumbers near me, right? You want your brand to carry some value as well. Um, and then that brand awareness also builds trust again, that also builds authority. So all of these things actually impact your search results. Visibility does impact your ability to be found in Google. Um, your backlinks, so people linking to you uh, impacts your visibility in Google. Being a well-known brand alone impacts your visibility on Google. Being associated with a well-known brand, even if you're not a well-known brand, impacts your visi visibility on Google. Uh, because one of the things that Google looks at are entities. And those are businesses, organizations, just in literally any noun, right? <laughs> that uh, they, have, they have a record of existing and understand what they do, why they do it, um, where they are and things like that. And the more uh, relationships your business has with entities, the bigger and better picture Google has of what your business does and why it's relevant for certain search terms. Um, and then to go with it, of course, how to track. Um, you want to make sure that you have the right tools to track these things because if you can't measure it, if, you can't, if you're not tracking it and you can't make sure that you're getting your return on investment if you're not tracking it. 
So there are a lot of great tools out there uh, to track search. How are you showing in search reputation and visibility? Uh, and I would be tracking all of those uh, for all of my locations if I was a franchise. Yep, thank you for sharing. All right, uh, identifying the right opportunities. So this is kind of, okay, you said we need to get into our data. What are we doing with that data? Uh, one, we're looking to understand our customers. Two, uh, we are looking to understand uh, what are people searching for that we don't have a relationship with now. Three, we're looking at how easy it is for us to be found online. And then four, we're looking at what are our competitors doing that we're not, which is something I touched on a little bit earlier. So with keyword research, really what we're doing is identifying irrelevant keywords. Um, we're reviewing the competitive landscape. So if, you, if you're not doing particularly well in visibility altogether, and search altogether, you're not going, you don't want to go after the most competitive keyword in your market immediately. Uh, you want to understand what are some of the terms that your competitors are neglecting and determine if those are fit enough well, well enough with your services that you should focus on those first. And then you want to improve the content on your website based on those services. Um, and then something that I see happen with franchises and multi-location businesses all the time is uh, the content usually isn't unique. So improving your content also means having unique, relevant content, not having the exact same content on every location page, finding ways to make them different and still relevant to the service so that Google feels like there's a reason to serve your content over someone else's. Opportunity. So uh, this is also one of my favorite things to do. Um, opportunity is a lot of different things. Uh, so opportunity could be, all right, well, uh, where where do we have competitors who are falling short as far as their SEO strategy because they're not ranking well, they're not producing new content, uh, they're not responding to reviews, they're not getting reviews regularly. But then there's also opportunity as as in like is are there opportunities for us to show up in cities where we don't necessarily have a physical location, but we'd be willing to serve that city? Um, that is one of my favorite parts of local SEO because it's something that is kind of, I wouldn't say sneaky, but it's kind of one of those things, like if you know how to do it, there's a lot of opportunity there for you. And it's not something that costs you a lot. It's just making sure that you're very intentional with your content and that you're focusing on the opportunities that are available to you based on uh, how much search volume is out there, how difficult it is to rank for those keywords and how much competition you have in those areas. There are low competition areas, I can guarantee you, for any industry um, in, in, in any near any major city. There are always these opportunities. They always exist. You just have to do a lot of work to find them sometimes because um, your competitors are also, if they, if they have smart SEOs on their team, they're also looking for those opportunities as well. Current reach. So like I said, you wanna have as much real estate on the, on the uh, first page of Google as possible. You wanna show up as many times as possible. And part of that is understanding local search ads, local service ads is understanding what gets you to the local pack and it's understanding what gets rewarded and shown in organic search results. Um, and then you wanna know how much search volume do those keywords that you currently show extremely well for have. Um, being on the first page is not, not an ideal situation if the keyword only has five searches per month, right? We want to be on the first page for keywords that have thousands of searches per month. Um, and, and that's what we're looking for. Your search, being on the first page is not enough. It's being on the first page for keywords that people are actually searching for and have enough volume and there's a clear intent to make a purchase or to interact with a company. So, uh, that's how what I use to determine our current reach. It's is how visible we are and what are those terms that we're visible for? Are they the terms that people are searching for? Uh, competitor analysis. Oh, I'm saying every everything is my favorite part, but this is also <laughs> one of my favorite parts of what I do. Uh, learning from your competitors is a great idea. It does that mean take everything they do and repeat it or copy it. It means to capitalize on their mistakes and uh, 
prioritize their their your strengths as well. That's that's what it is. So, you, but you can't do that if you don't know what your competitors are doing. Um, we use a ton of SEO tools, uh, very common ones though, like just some of the ones I mentioned before, just to determine where our competitors are. Uh, where are they getting links from? Uh, when we look at their content, are we like, oh, we should be doing that? Or are we like, oh, this content is so generic. I can see this anywhere. Um, I've seen this so many different times. I've seen this on all of our competitor sites. There's nothing special about what they're doing. Um, is their site faster than yours? Does it provide a better mobile experience? Are people able to get to the pages or content that they're looking for faster? Uh, those are the things that you should be looking at because those are the decision makers. Uh, one of the things also is like, are, are they building trust better than, than you are? Are they, are they doing things like including um, empathy-based marketing or audience-based marketing where they're talking about how they serve their community? How they, are they touching on the client's pain points more than trying to sell to them? These are all things that you should be aware of because some of the most successful businesses that we see are businesses that don't don't go heavy on the selling. They go heavy on um, on the emotional side of the purchase. And that ends up helping them out because they have more unique content because they're not focusing on selling because there's only so many ways you could talk about fixing someone's AC unit, right? So they're focusing on what that experience is like for the customer and what they want to know instead, instead of what they want people to do. And uh, the best marketing is marketing without someone knowing that you're marketing to them. And that's exactly what they're doing. All right, prioritization. So I just talked about a lot of different things you can find with your data. And the next question is, okay, I found all these things that I think we should be doing differently. How do I decide what I should do first, right? Uh, what is most important? What's gonna get me the best results as far as, um, and, and best results as in getting leads or improving uh, traffic or whatever your goals are, improving visibility, whatever your goal is. Um, and we'll get a little in, into that in the next slide. So prioritization, uh, Google, you can't rank if Google can't find you. So <laughs> indexability is the first thing that I would focus on. And that sounds like a common sense, like tongue in cheek comment, but this is something that I actually audited a website about earlier today where there were, they did not have a sitemap, they did not have a robots.txt file. And these are basic elements of a website that helps Google understand which pages should be crawled and found and which pages shouldn't. Um, so these are things that a lot of large sites sometimes get wrong and it does hurt your performance because you cannot rank if you can't be found um, by Google or if you've told Google not to even look at those pages. A lot of times we also find that pages are being Google uh, have been marked as no indexed. So we're telling Google not to show those pages, even though those are pages that we want to be found. So that is one of the first things that I look at is um, how easy it is to find the pages for Google. And if you're not sure how to do that, you use a website crawler. Um, so you can use something like Sitebulb or Screaming Frog, and it will crawl your pages on your website and tell you which pages are indexable or not indexable. And indexable means it's, it can be found by a crawler and in, non-indexable means it cannot be or it um, would not be served in search results. So that's one of the things that I looked at, um, not mobile friendly. Uh, that is something that will really harm you significantly. Uh, Google has gone to mobile first indexing. It's been that way for the last few years now, but there are still examples of sites who have not kind of updated to meet that that standard. If your website is not mobile friendly first, you're going to suffer. Um, you're not going to perform as well as the competitors who are focusing on the mobile experience for their users. So really indexability is about user experience and it's about uh, technical issues on your site. Uh, if you can crawl your website and, um, and, and it says that you have for internal linking or redirecting redirects, um, internal redirects or things like that, or if it says you don't have a sitemap, that's a sign that there are likely bigger issues at play that you need to focus on or you need someone to help you um, fix because those are often issues that means that there's a good chance you're having a ton of pages that aren't, aren't even being crawled by Google. Um, if you're curious to know if your pages are being crawled, crawled by Google or not, you can go to Google Search Console and it'll show you which pages 
have been uh, crawled and indexed. So you'll be able to see the difference there and notice that what, what pages aren't being indexed and why, find out why that's happening and figuring out what you need to do to get those pages visible. Because there are a ton of sites out there that have thousands of pages that aren't even being indexed currently. So there, those pages exist, but they're doing nothing as far as an SEO value for their site. Next, uh, if you're indexable, if you, you can be found and Google says, okay, I'm gonna put you in search results. Next is that visibility in search results. What are the things that impact that? Uh, duplicate content. So uh, this is like, if you've ever talked to an SEO, you, they either have a one or two. Well, there's like two, two uh, ways of thinking about duplicate content. Some people believe that it hasn't, doesn't change anything at all. And some people believe that like, oh yeah, it can hurt your site. I am in a camp that, oh yeah, it can hurt your site because I've seen it happen to a franchise personally who hired us and the first thing we did was fix duplicate content issue. And they had franchisees that went from being very upset with them to being extremely happy because they were finally getting leads. And the main thing we did was to improve the content on their pages. That was it. Uh, so that is a that is truly a problem, especially if you're in a competitive market. Uh, if, I'll put it this way. I think this is an easy way for anyone to understand. If you have two websites to look at and one of them has the same content on every page except they change the city and state and one of them is unique on every page, which one do you think is going to be more interesting to show people? The one that's going to be unique on every page. I think it's a very easy a uh, very easy way to put it is like, what is in Google's best interest and what is in the user's best interest? And it's not going to be duplicate content. Um, another thing I would look at is Google business profiles. So this is how you get to show up in Google Maps and get Google reviews um, for services. Uh, so making sure that all of your locations have them and that you have access to them. Um, that is a whole nother story. There could be an entire series about Google My Business <laughs> Management because it is a wild place to be um, because there are a lot of duplicate listings out there. There are a lot of listings that were made by sales reps or someone who's no longer with the company and no one has access to and can't change or update or is getting reviews and no one can respond to them, those types of issues too. So there's a ton of things that could be going on with Google business profiles that you're not even aware exists for your company that you should find a way to get a hold of. And one of those things you can do is to use a crawler to crawl using your business name and trying to find uh, each listing for each each major area that you serve or each major each state. Um, I've worked with clients before where they were um, government agents recruiting agencies and they did not know how many listings recruiters had made or where they were at all. So I used the crawler to find every listing that I could find that Google had um, available and I had to go state by state to find those. Um, so that may be something that you end up having to do depending on uh, how big your service area is and how many people have the ability to create listings for you. Um, and then lastly, uh, conversions. So uh, conversions are, uh, first we want to work on, can I be found? And then can I be seen? And then can, do people want to interact with me? So um, <laughs> Poor quality landing pages is probably one of the biggest things that I see that's an issue after duplicate content. Uh, if this is the first page that you want to show someone when they go to your website, it needs to be a page that meet, uh, meets all the needs of a visitor that you want to have a good interaction with. Um, it's not, it shouldn't just be duplicate content or poor quality content. It should be unique content. It should provide trust signals. So why should that person want to do business with you? It should provide how that person should do business with you. It should provide what you do. It should give every uh, a site visitor everything they need to make a decision right on that page. Almost like a PVC landing page, but it's intended for SEO. It's the page that ranks for uh, whatever that senior care, uh, Boise, that whatever page that ranks for that should have all of those things in there that can help you, uh, build trust and convert on that page without them visiting any other page on your website. You want that page to answer every question that they could have and make it the easiest decision for them to just go ahead and do business with you. Um, all right. so here just to step in briefly. Um, if you've again been to a conference um, or any of our past webinars, 
Um, this is what we've promised, which is a, a little checklist for you to take away. So definitely feel free to screenshot this um, and take notes as Amanda will dive in. So back to you. Yeah, so uh, this is kind of like your local SEO checklist. Like these are things that every business should be doing no matter their industry, no matter the market, no matter what their competitors are doing. This is kind of like uh, foundational. Like if I, I want to be seen and I'm not sure what I should start with, this is where you should start. Uh, give Google all the local, local information it needs. I would, to me, this means give Google all of the local information you have about your business. So in addition to um, your name, address, phone number, those types of things, um, mention landmarks that are nearby. Take pictures of people wearing your company logo at landmarks that are near you. Like go as far as you think it, it, it takes because Google is, uh, is getting data from images. They have this thing called Vision AI and they're using it to understand the context of images. And the more context you give Google in different forms of media, the better off you are at showing your local relevance. So you want to give Google as many tips and clues about your business as possible. So you do that by giving them your information directly, right? Like this is where we're located. This is our Google My Business listing. Um, these are the people that work here and they're also located here. Um, but you also want to include like, these are the businesses nearby us or our partners that we work with. Uh, you want to include your structured data or schema markup on your site, which is code that goes on the back end of your website that can give Google additional information that you might not necessarily want to show up in the front end. Uh, so you can do that as well. Um, and identify your sweet spot keyword. Uh, this is something that I think can be difficult for businesses to identify in some places uh, and for some industries. So I spoke to someone, I think yesterday or the day before yesterday, and the keyword that they wanted to rank for was not the keyword that was most highly associated with their business, uh, according to Ahrefs. And that's because uh, the, the information on their website did not accurately reflect what they wanted to rank for. So it's important to make sure that your content reflects what you actually want to be seen for. Um, and so it's better not to dance around it and just be direct. Like if you're like I said, if you're a home health care company, you want to say home health care in Boise, Idaho. You don't want to say home care or um, care for people who stay at home or care for seniors. And you want to use that exact keyword um, in that placement, especially in page titles and your H1 tags and things like that. Um, and let's see, next we have ensure your location is, yep, I think I kind of covered that in the first one. And when you're giving Google that location, that local information that's throughout your website, it's not on one page. It's making sure that that is clear throughout your website and then building relationships between your business and that location through blog posts, through navigation items, through service pages. So taking all the opportunities throughout your website to make that uh, connection between your location and what your business offers um, through your content. Submit your site to high quality directories. So that includes uh, the typical ones like TripAdvisor, Yelp, whatever is relevant for your industry. But in addition to that, um, make sure you look up and do some Barnacle SEO research too, which is looking up who shows up on the first page for like top 10 best or top five or best rated for your industry in that city and make sure that you show up in those lists too. So that may be uh, getting on a Yelp list, getting on a home advisor list and building your reviews up on that uh, platform so that you can be included on that list. I would consider that as part of being on high quality local directories. Uh, seek out Google, Google reviews. Like I mentioned before, you can't, you can't just hope that you passively get positive reviews. Unfortunately, that is not how it works. Uh, if you wait for positive reviews, the most of the reviews you're going to get are going to be negative. Even if you have a great business and most of the time people are extremely happy, unfortunately, the people who are more likely to leave a review unprovoked are going to be the people who aren't happy. So make sure that you have a strategy in place to proactively ask for reviews. Um, the best times to do that are when customers are going to be the happiest. Um, Google has policies against uh, review uh, gatekeeping. So you can't 
tell someone like, oh, no, we don't want you to leave a review because it's negative. You can't make it harder for them to leave a negative review, but you can think about when people are more likely to be happy with your business and specifically ask for reviews during those times. That's not against anyone's policy. So you can actively say like, hey, someone just signed up for a service. This is a good chance, a good time to sign up for a review. We just completed service and they're talking to their uh, to their plumber or the technician who came out. That's a good time to ask for a review. Uh, so using the touch points where they're uh, actively working with or speaking with someone from your company and they're having a good experience. So those are the times to request the review. Um, another, yeah, adding trust signals to encourage conversions and then actually having those conversion opportunities on the site. Those are two things that kind of go hand in hand because we're not inviting people to our website for the sake of doing it, uh, for, for the sake of just having the traffic. We want them to take an action. So uh, what we want to do is to make sure that we give them a reason to want to work with us. And it's not the same reason they have to work with any of our competitors. We want to make sure we stand out. We give them a reason to trust us over our competitors and want to work with us over our competitors. And then we want to ask them to do something like, right? Like we want to ask them to give us a call to get a free quote or estimate, or we want them to sign up for a newsletter. Just make sure that you have that ask near your trust signals as well, because that'll help. If they can see like, oh, well, this is a great testimonial. I trust this company. I want to work with them. Having that opportunity to convert nearby is going to increase your likelihood that they're going to complete that action. Um, and then let's see, content is relevant to customer focus. I think I've said that a few times, something that that is super important. And then building uh, uh, building your authority through backlinks. This is another thing that I see a lot of businesses suffer um, suffer within rankings because it's hard to do. Uh, uh, building your authority and building, you're building your authority with customers, right? So people know that, oh yeah, this is someone I can trust for this service, but you're also building your authority with Google. You want Google to understand your relevance and that you're a trustworthy business for a service. And that comes through with uh, backlinks and content. So getting backlinks, not just from any website, but uh, local websites, topical authority websites, um, uh, relevant websites, those are the things that those sites you need backlinks for. Please do not go to a .blogspot.com <laughs> um, PBN network and get black backlinks. Those are not going to help you. Um, the backlinks that are going to help you are from authoritative sites. Um, and that doesn't mean that they have a ton of backlinks. Uh, it could just mean that they are a local personality that is well known. It could mean that this person has or this business has its own Wikipedia page. So Google understands who they are and the entity behind that business. Those count too. Um, they have a, a lot of value. It doesn't matter what their domain authority is. If it's a true local business that is well known in your industry or well known in your area. I think we're ready for the next one. Make it easy and repeatable. So I'm gonna say again, this is my favorite part because they're all my favorite parts. Uh, make it easy and repeatable. I love working with teams that are not SEOs and it's because I love making them SEO evangelists because they understand the importance of what we're doing and why we're doing it. And that I'm actually making their job easier. Like I'm not making it harder and I can give them credit when we get the results. I would, I love saying, Hey, me and the tech and the engineering team worked on this issue on the site and look at the results that we got from it. And then they can tie what their work they're doing to the bottom line, of the company to revenue. And that is extremely powerful um, to be able to do that and to be able to make those relationships in, in your company so that when you ask for things, they're more likely to get done because you're, you're the one that makes the company money. They can see that direct correlation between what you're asking to do, asking them to help you with, and um, the company succeeding. Uh, this is a quote from Steve Jobs. Simple can be harder than complex. You have to work hard to get your thinking clean to make it simple, but it's worth it in the end because once you get there, you can move mountains. So this is like, like I said, getting buy-in from other team members, it gets so much easier when you've uh, simplified the process for them. Um, and then it makes it easier to do new things in the future if you already have similar processes that you can take and modify to use to your advantage into creating new things. And it makes it easier for other people to understand too. You're building up the, uh, the knowledge of SEO and marketing and your other team members when you're giving them processes to work on or you're giving them tasks to work on that's based on a process that's 
very clearly relate it to SEO and data analysis and marketing. So using that, um, that type of mindset makes it easier to get things done. And not only that, now you have more allies within the company to help you get these things done because they understand um, how their role and your role interacts and how you can help each other. So um, one of the things that I uh, like to talk about a lot is always making things actionable. Um, no one wants you to come to them with a ton of problems and no solutions, right? Uh, they want to know what the solution is, how much time does it take to get to get the results, right? Um, how, how much does it cost to do it? Um, and like, how much does it uh, interrupt current workflows? Those are the things that I always think about before I make a recommendation. I want to make it as easy as possible. I want to be, make it as in, attractive as possible for people to work with me in getting SEO initiatives completed. Um, and I know in a lot of uh, corporate environments, it takes a long time to get anything actually implemented. And I completely understand that. And sometimes it's out of control because there's so many different departments and people that need to get involved uh, before something can be decided on. But what helps make that process easier is if you've done as much of the heavy and heavy work as you can to make it easier for, for the decision makers to say yay or nay, right? So one of the things I always work on is making sure that my plans are actionable. It's not just an idea. There is strategy. I can show them the data behind it and I can show them what results I believe we'll get from it, as well as I can show them what teams need to be involved. I've already talked to those teams. I already know how much effort it would take them, how long it would take them, if they can fit it into... Um, whatever they're working on at the time as well, so that it makes it as easy as possible for someone to say yes to something that I want to implement. Remove roadblocks. Yeah, like I said, like I kind of went over this already. Um, you want to create solutions that require as little, um, I would say like mental and physical anguish to someone else as possible. Like you don't want to be adding to the stress of someone else's day every time you're asking for some something. Uh, you want to be making it as easy and as simple as possible to implement anything that you're coming forward with that will impact SEO. Um, and that could mean that you could mean that you could have already researched tools, right? Yeah, you could have already determined uh, the financial benefit. So you can say, well, we need to buy this tool, but this is how much money we'd be saving by doing it this way. We actually end up saving more money than we're spending if we do it this way. Uh, you want to be putting together solutions that uh, that includes the thinking about the roadblocks, thinking about any uh, pushback that you might get ahead of time and accounting for them and planning for that to happen and having a solution for them already. So um, find the right tools. Oh, sorry. Need to take a drink. So you want to automate and simplify repeatable tasks as much as possible, uh, which Promo Republic is great for. It's one of the tools I would recommend doing using for that purpose. And some of the ones that I mentioned earlier as well will help with that. Um, so what you want to do is make it as easy as possible to find justifications and to present them in a way that makes sense to other teams. Um, it saves you time, it saves them time, and it makes it much easier for people to um, go along with what you're what you're trying, what whatever strategy or tactic you're trying to implement, if they can see the data behind it and that it's actually going to save them time and money. Thank you so much for sharing a breadth of knowledge and experience um, that you've gone into great detail today. Um, in the chat box, I've actually shared a link where you're able to, for those listening today, you're able to book a consultation because as Amanda highlighted, data is so important um, when you're doing your initial research and breakdown of what your health status is of your SEO at the moment. So we're happy to break down the different silos that Amanda highlighted today um, through our intelligence engine. So if you're interested in getting 
um, an audit, definitely click that and follow through. We will capture and analyze the um, digital profiles you have and visualize it. And more importantly, give suggestions on how to improve. So you can make these data back decisions that Amanda's highlighted today. Um, so if you're also interested in contacting Amanda, definitely feel free to do so. You see her email here, as well as the LinkedIn, which you can scan via the QR code. So definitely don't hesitate to get those phones out or take a screenshot here. Um, and we, of course, have some time for questions. And Amanda, you can tell that this was such a great webinar because we have so many questions to go through. So we're going to try our best to get through um, the questions. And feel free to write either in the question and answer box or the chat box right now, um, should you have any further questions. Um, but we'll start off um, with this first question from Ian. Um, this is about the thoughts, suggestions, or tips on ways to create unique content for every location in a franchise without being too burdensome on the content team, um, which I know is a question that everyone here can empathize with. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And I completely understand this question. Um, I actually talked about this uh, at a conference earlier this year. So uh, one of my tips is to um, get your franchisee owners to uh, provide additional information about their location. So one of the things you can do is create a survey for them um, and just have them answer uh, simple questions about the location and then use that as content on the page. Uh, user generated content is always great too. So if you can pull in reviews from Google, that is a great way to get that content and then third party content. So there's interesting statistics and information about that city related to your business or about that area. That is a great way also to get unique content. Um, Orkin Pest Control actually uses this strategy. They will show you the most common pests in your area based on your city. So that is a good way for them to have unique content because while it's going to be somewhat similar, right? If you're in the southeastern United States like me, there are very common <laughs> pests for you to worry about that are that uh, I imagine exist like all over all over this area. But it also still helps, at least from a regional perspective, to have unique content. Um, and then, of course, there's going to be content that is specific to that location always, which is like landmarks and things like that. Um, depending on what industry you're in, there's other things that you can do, kind of like the pest control example. Um, if you're like a hotel chain, you can always include uh, nearby attractions or things to do. Um, if you're like a daycare center, you can include information about nearby parks or activities to do with your kids. There's like a, a lot of opportunities there. Um, and a lot of times I see businesses use to get those opportunities and find that information to use, just use crawlers and crawl Google and get the information and just stick it on the site without having to um, have someone manually look for those opportunities. Yeah, thank you for sharing. I'm just kind of piggybacking off of that question. We have a question from Megan, which is what is the crawler tool that you recommended for Google business profiles? Uh, there is a ton of them. I think the one that I've used most recently is Octoparse, and it will allow you to just uh, crawl all of, search, it will let you crawl search results and it will capture the link, the URL link and things like that, whatever you really specify that you want it to capture from the search result and put it in a spreadsheet for you. So there are a lot of tools like that available. Um, if you have someone on your team that's a, a data analysis expert or uses Python, they can make a crawler for you and do it for you. And then you don't have to find a tool at all. Um, I would say that's probably a preferred way to do it is if you have someone on your team that is a developer um, is to have them uh, actually crawl, uh, get the crawl data for you because then they can make it set whatever metrics they want and get that data uh, for you pretty easily. All right, thank you. Um, one question from Thomas is, for a new website or new Google, new Google business profile, would you recommend, what would you recommend as a top priority um, creating a blog with for blog posts, targeting long trail keywords, including primary category, city, and the title, or how would you recommend that be set up? Yeah, for a blog, it, I'm going to give the most annoying SEO answers, which is it depends really, because it's going to depend on uh what are people searching for? That would be what I'm, where I would go first. Um, if you're seeing that there's not actually a lot of long tail keywords being searched for, and it's a lot of bottom of the funnel intent, so they're just looking to buy or purchase a service or a product, 
uh, I would focus more so on service pages instead. Um, if you find that there are a ton of nearby areas that you could serve that are looking for those bottom of funnel keywords too, that has more search for volume than um, those like long tail keywords, I would go to those cities first. Um, I, I don't always recommend a blog just because then it means that you need to keep up with it. There's sometimes there's uh, for some industries and then like some industries, people aren't going to read your blog, right? Like uh, electricians likely don't get a lot of hits on their blog posts unless it's something that's it's just extremely popular nationwide. Um, but for the most part, and then you're competing with every other electrician who has an SEO who also wants to rank for that. But uh, my my goal would be to make sure that you're hitting all of your clear intent bottom of funnel keywords first, and then look at the blog post as um, what are those people also ask questions that are showing up for those clear intent keywords and search results. And then trying to make sure that you have a good answer for all of those people also ask questions and FAQ pages as well. So making sure you have a FAQ page that covers all of those top questions that come up for whatever that uh, specific website is focused on. Great, thank you. And the last question that we have is actually from Alex, which is, can you recommend actionable steps when there's a duplicate uh, listing, for example, in Google Business Profile? Um, the case that he gave is, if a franchisee left the business and after they created their own, and you highlighted this in your overview today, if someone leaves, you don't have like their access to yeah. So what would you recommend to do in that case? Yeah. So the good thing, good news is that if it's a duplicate Google My Business listing and you have access to one of them, you can actually go into the support chat in Google My Business and tell them that there's a duplicate listing and send them the URL for the duplicate and they'll just remove it for you. As long as you have access to one of the listings, you can, um, because if you have access to it there and you've, they've already verified it with you, they know that you're an actual owner. So that's not really a question for them anymore. As long as you can pinpoint the duplicate listing and send them the link to it, they should uh, pretty quickly and uh, get rid of that uh, duplicate for you without too much of a, a hassle. They usually don't ask you for any other evidence than other than, hey, what's the URL for that duplicate listing? Great. Um, I did not see any additional um, questions come through. Um, so again, in the chat box, you have the link if you would like to book an audit with us. And you also have Amanda's contact information. Um, so that is here. Um, on the screen um, here. So with that said, Amanda, thank you so much for being such a great speaker today and kicking off our series on such a high note that everyone in the future is going to have to match in our expert talks. Um, this was so great to learn from you. So I did want to, you know, thank you and um, thank you for your time today. It was great. And thank you everyone for joining and learning with us. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun. Of course. Well, that's it for our first installment of our expert talks. We'd love your feedback to hear what you thought. Um, but again, thank you, Amanda, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye.